Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Music and Beyond. I'm Ernie Crazy Eyes from Recall Productions. Today, I have one of the guests that I've never, you know, ever, even dreamt, dreamed about, you know, having here on my podcast, but it's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, today I bring you this awesome interview with Kevin Rudolph. You might recognize his voice from you know, I made it or let it rock or drop drop the world. I is it drop the world? Uh, um no, I wasn't on Drop the World, but oh, I Oh welcome I did. welcome to the world. Welcome, welcome to the world. Welcome to the world, yeah, one way trip with Wayne. Uh, a lot of 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 stuff. A lot of different kinds of some kinds of things. Yeah, man, like honestly like that whole that whole uh, era of music, like as much as as much as I wasn't into it back then, like, you know, looking back at it, like, I appreciate it now because, like, that was, those were bangers that, you know, like, I was too, like, you know, blindly to see. And, you know, now I listen to all that music. I'm like, man, I remember those days just sitting down in, in my cousin's floor and, you know, just drinking a beer while... They're doing their thing, and it was a party, man. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad. I'm happy to help. Happy to help with the party. Yeah, but uh, um, I want to talk about the about your your breakout hit, man. Let it rock. It became a massive success. Um, how did how did it feel to achieve such a widespread recognition in your early career? Well, you know, I had I had been signed <clears throat> signed to a label called Maverick through Warner Brothers, and I'd been dropped and started again. I went behind the scenes, and I I just wanted to be a producer, so I was working with Timbaland, and I was mainly playing guitar. I felt like I was a kind of like a secret agent because I was really just trying to absorb everything that I was learning, and then using the the, the guitar as a sort of a decoy, in a way to just to be in that environment. So we had worked on a lot of records and some hit records, Say It Right by Nelly Furtado and, and um, uh, Lil' Kim records, Black Eyed Peas, a variety of stuff. And I was just really about, I wasn't so much about getting on the records or whether that mattered or not. I was just like in a study mode where I was really absorbing that stuff, which sounds kind of funny to say now because everything is just so intense, you know, insanely available. Like you can go online, you can download those drums, you can get from here, you can watch YouTube. You can watch TikToks. People will tell you every secret, how to do everything, which is great because it's very easy to learn how to make good records. But at the same time, it's also become very saturated. So back then, it was really about absorbing that knowledge and, oh, my God, where do you get those drums from? Where do you get those samples from? It was it was, um, it was was something that was really um, like a fire inside me where I wanted to learn, you know, and I felt like if I could incorporate what he was doing into what I – had already done as sort of a musician, songwriter, guitar player all around, then I would have something that I could really, um, really to offer, to give, you know, whether it be as a producer or an artist. And then I kind of hit the ceiling with that. And it just sort of felt like I wasn't going to get any further out than just sort of playing guitar. And I knew I had to be an artist again, because that's what was inside my, it was in my bones, you know, I'd, I'd done it already. And and um, and I just I loved creating my own music by myself. Did I, I wait? We didn't even answer that question, did we? We just we get we gave the backstory. <laughs> yeah. We answered another question. But um, yeah. So so as far as Let It Rock goes, so I said all that to say that I had a lot of experience, be it in the industry, in the studio, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, and um, by the time Let It Rock came out, it was just like. It's funny, people often say, what's it like having a hit record? It's it's like a mixture of like intense love from the world. There was less internet talk back then, so you weren't getting as much visible hate. But but it was just, it was a dream because I had kind of closed the book in a way on something that I always wanted to achieve as a kid, which was to to, to, to do something in the world, you know, to make a mark, to create something that people vibe with and, and love. And I just thought it, this is the coolest thing to make something in my bedroom. And then like 24 hours a day, someone's listening, you know, someone's listening to it and where you were at in Texas drinking a beer, someone else is like 
shaking their ass in Melbourne, Australia. Someone else is, is, you know, breaking up to it, graduating to it, falling in love to it, you know, whatever, whatever that may mean, you know, I've got all these people strange, like not strange, very cool, strange, but a lot of people on TikTok said, you know, I, I, it was, just, it was the only song my dad and I both liked. And so we would rock out to it and, that's my memory of me with my dad and and that's that's really special so all those things that's what it was really about to me it was about saying something and then having the world respond so it's it's a really it's an amazing high and it's it's a feeling that it once you have it you will chase for the rest of your life it's it's really it's it's pretty incredible yeah man and uh honestly like uh when when I when I discovered you, I was in high school and stuff. So, um, you know, I started to party here and there with my cousin, and you know, like we we would listen to you, we would listen to Wayne, we would listen to to Ross. But in the background, you know, like I'm like, man, can we just put on some like Limp Biscuit? Because you know, that's what that's what I grew up with. And when, we did a song. I did a song with with Fred. Yeah, I, I was listening to it the other day, and I was like, man, I forgot about this song. Like, this song was so good. Like, honestly, like, on Facebook, I troll people because, uh, you know, like, for some reason, people love to hate Limp Biscuit as much as they like to hate Creed or Nickelback. Sure. And I'm just like, dude, like, if you guys actually, like, sit down and listen to the music, like, it's freaking amazing. <laughs> yeah, people love to, um, you know, people are very emotional about music, and it's actually a good thing. You know, if you're not getting a lot of hate, you're definitely not getting a lot of love. And the worst thing you can do is is, is just be ignored. And um, it's hard to process when you're young and you're starting out and you're seeing people say things like, you suck, you, you, you're you stupid. You, suck. you know, those things bothered me a little bit because I was new. You know, I didn't, you don't, you don't know you're, you know, you, you're, you're, flung out into the world by a system, by a mechanism, which is all the record company, the stuff that a record company could do or radio or having, you're being pushed out into the world and you're getting different responses. But the, the only thing that really bothered me was when I people would say that I was a singer. And I'm like, I'm I'm really not a singer. I'm, I'm like a vocal, I'm a producer and more of a vocal stylist. You know, that's how I sort of see myself. Um, but they would think that I someone else wrote my record or produced it, which is why I wanted to do a lot of those TikToks just to set the record straight and and leave that imprint with the correct information. Okay, okay, yeah. And honestly, I'm so thankful for your TikToks because I don't know if I said this already, but man, you freaking opened up something that was missing for from my memory for so long, and um, oh, you know, you it. just you just telling the stories about your songwriting and all that stuff. Like, I love to hear stuff about that, you know, because um, so cool. I want I, I want to know what your mindset is when writing certain music and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, my mindset, you know, mindset can change at, at different times, obviously. And I think, you know, it sort of goes back to the question that people often ask, what are your influences? And, you know, where do you start with that stuff? And it's kind of like, well, when I was, you know, 12, I was a metalhead and I was like into shredding and playing guitar. When I was 15, I was into like songwriting and, and and you know, all kinds of like, I was into like Peter Gabriel and Sting and, and the Beatles and John Lennon, you know, I mean, a wide, wide variety of stuff, obviously. But, you know, and then when I was, 18, I was into hip hop and I was into making beats. So I, I went through all these phases. So a lot of what I, I do is, is, is like, um, a big collage of all those things. And sometimes I'll lean one way and sometimes I'll lean another way, depending on a song or if it's an artist I'm producing or something with myself. Um, but, um, you know, my mindset at the time when I was making Let It Rock and that period was, um, I think I, I think it was like right before then. I remember I was making a lot of, a lot of sort of like, kind of like love-ish, more like love-ish songs, you know. And I had this friend. He's like, "Dude, that's not you. 
you the way you speak, you're like fucking aggressive. You're like I'm not saying you're an angry person, but you're you're aggressive, kind of, you know. And you, that's in there. And you know, could you tap into that in your in your writing more? And that's what I started to do, and that felt like I had landed on something that was the right the right thing that was resonating with me. It's the way I wanted to um, move forward. I don't know how, to, how else to describe it. And I was hungry, you know. I was broke. I was I wasn't doing anything. I was sitting there feeling like I hadn't done anything yet, and and that that's a real it's a real pain. For, for a young person like who who wants to achieve a lot and you feel like you you haven't done anything yet in the world and um those are like almost mortal type fears you know they're they sort of they're like ancient fears in a weird way you know you've been born into a world and you've not impacted that world in some way i don't know if everybody feels like that they probably don't but i think most artists do feel that way you know you're sort of born with a hole in your Self, in your heart, in your psyche that you need to fill. And it feels like the only way to fill that is to make an impact. So I was feeling a lot of those feelings at that time and I was channeling was channeling it all into the music. So when I was saying stuff like, when I arrive, I bring the fire, that was my own chant to the world to say, I'm bringing the fire. When I arrive, you're going to feel it. Yeah, and uh, something I didn't know about that song and, like, you know, when you said, I bring the fire, like, you know, 18-year-old me, 17-year-old me didn't know, you know, that was, like, biblical. Yeah, it it, it was. I mean, I had um, a lot of sort of previous, you know, experiences and things where I, I sort of had you know, a lot of knowledge and, and, um, so it's funny. I I often go back to biblical references when I, when I write and I I try to separate it for people. I'm I'm not saying it's a Christian song or not a Christian song. It's, It's however you, your relationship is with God and how you perceive things. I'm not pushing any, anything on anyone. I'm just trying to get you in touch with your, your power. You know, whether that be through God, through yourself, however that is, because we're all really connected, I think, much deeper than we even understand. So um, it's just funny. It just came to me, you know. I see your dirty face hide behind your collar. I was talking about hypocrisy, and it was my anger coming out of that stuff and and just the sort of distrust of the system and the world more so than anything, and then saying, using it as a metaphor for when I say, when I arrive, I bring the fire. I'm speaking from what I feel is the voice of God. So it's not so much, I don't want to make it overly like, you know, Book of Revelation and and apocalyptic and that kind of thing. I was just really saying, when I arrive, I bring the truth, I bring the fire, I burn through hypocrisy, and you're going to know. That was kind of, again, like I'm putting words around a feeling and an intention. But that's really what it was. Yeah, and I totally, I totally see that song in a different, in a different, uh, in a different way now that I know that story. Because one thing that I've always loved about, you know, listening like to musicians and stuff is the way that they write their lyrics. And if, you know, like if they play around with the lyrics and, you know, and listening to your music all these years, like, you know, it just seems like you like to have fun with the lyrics and, you know, you enjoy what you're, what you're doing. And, you know, that's beautiful that, that you can enjoy what you're doing and, you know, bring out either the me- like a positive message or just, you know, maybe you just want to have to. Maybe you just want to say something, and yeah, it's 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 really it's tricky, you know, and, and it kind of always has been in a way with 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 the intention of saying something positive because I always want to be positive 
you know i i always want to bring light to the world and 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 the good things you know the 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 uh, you know empowerment that's that's kind of where it feels like musically my journey has been about bringing empowerment to people it's never really been about love relationship stuff none of those songs that i've done or tried have really seemed to resonate with people in that same way as when I do the empowerment songs, I made it, let it rock, champions, welcome to the world. Those are those are the ones that seem to resonate with people. And it's tricky because you can't really write a song and go, "You are great, you are wonderful." You know what I mean? And people are like, ah, "Fuck out of here." You know what I mean? But um, but I, I would, I would, I actually would like to write songs like that. You know. I, I think I think the only person who could almost get away with it is like a John Lennon or or Bob Marley. You know, there's something about those two artists. They're somehow be able to, able to bring just pure positive message, and and somehow it works. You know, all you need is love. Imagine those records. You know, Bob Marley, One Love. You know, I mean, Three Love. All, all of it. It's just there's. Somehow, the, the, there, there's it's easier with them. For me, it feels like it needs to come from an aggressive place for it to be digestible. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. Like, does it make sense? I know it, it's kind of does. It does. It does. It really does. Like, uh, honestly, I, I feel, I, I feel it. I feel it. Um, I I just you know like I never saw music I I never saw because I know you I knew you as like part of uh, Cash Money yeah so I didn't really like you know you didn't I was get like, too oh, deep like, into it yeah 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 and like you know like listening to your music all these other all these years after Cash Money I was just like holy smokes I had this guy all wrong like you know this is <laughs> pretty freaking cool <laughs> oh I appreciate that man. Yeah, I was. I mean, you know, I I I really I hope it doesn't sound like I'm, uh, you know, I'm like bitter about it because I'm beyond grateful for everything that's happened, every success I've had. But I always felt misinterpreted, you know, and and it's very easy to say that because everyone feels misinterpreted. No one can see you the exact way you're seeing yourself. But I really felt like in the city, my first album. It was a concept album. It was a coming of age story about me growing up in New York. I felt like if I had just had a platform even like social media, like a TikTok back then, you know, I would have felt been able to fully explain that. You know, remember back then, you put out a record, I mean, when I say a single, even an album, and you're kind of going off of four press photos, whatever the label told the world through, through a publicist, and your music videos. And like, that's you for a solid year. Your artwork, all those things, you only have, you have very, um, large impact um, pieces of content, if you if you will, but they're not. Um, if one of them is wrong, or they're all wrong, or that's you for the year. You know, I I never understood people. You know, we had done like radio shows with a lot of very pop artists, like you know Lady Gaga and Katy Perry, and and I was perceived as like a pop artist. I you have to understand, I was shocked. The label was shocked when we got top 40 radio. Everyone thought it was like, let it rock sounding like nine inch nails to them. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And, and it was, and it was really like I, it, when I was sitting in that bedroom making those records, I was thinking, I was thinking like underground cult favorite. And I was like, oh, it's so sick. Nas is on, on the album. We got Rick Ross on it, Lil Wayne's on it. It's going to be like some, and it was, it was perceived as like, Cash money like gave me a bunch of money and to buy a bunch of features or something, which was the exact opposite. Everyone did everything for free because they just fucked with the music and they we we liked each other. You know, we just had a good relationship. And I just I feel like again that's why I like doing the TikToks because I like to try to present what actually is going on because I, I sort of, sort of felt like I did feel a little bit misrepresented at the time. Yeah, and I, I honestly I'm so grateful for 
uh, for TikTok because I've met so many musicians and, um, you know, it, it opens it opens memories because I can see like, oh, this person is using like, you know, a Limp Bizkit song. Like, I'm going to follow them because I love Limp Bizkit or, oh, somebody likes the Insane Clown Posse. Like, yeah. I like the Insane Clown Posse. Like, you know, yeah, like, no doubt. And I, think, and I think those two people because... Like, I love those two bands, but for some reason, it's bad for me to like them because the world doesn't accept them. It's true. It's true. The The world is, is it's sort of very skewed. You know, you look at, like, big transitions in music, like, from the 80s to the 90s. You know, you had all the glam metal, which suddenly was, like, immediately hated by all the grunge. And, and then, you know, on and on, similar things with hip-hop during, during you know, the different time periods and and rock and, you know, all the way back to like the the seventies when you had your big bands, like your, what was it like Boston and all those sort of Eagles were like suddenly hated by the punk rock movement, you know? And then 10 years later, like people are like, Oh, sh- that shit was dope. <laughs> you know what I mean, like they're like, it's, we go through cultural things and there's a lot of passion for style and music and, and what's cool and what's not. People wear it as a badge of honor or, or a guilty pleasure in some cases, you know, where they think, oh, I like this, but it's not cool that I like that. I didn't, I was very, 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 very lucky that I didn't grow up with any of that. I so I had like a, a major blind spot to that stuff. Like I, if I thought something was cool, it's cool. And it's still, you know, mom, she, she was a singer. And when I was growing up and she was in rock bands and, um, you know, I, I would listen to everything from Blondie to the Ramones to, Pat Benatar to Led Zeppelin. So she had all her old vinyl still. And I was listening to all that stuff, taking it all in, Van Halen, everything. It was all, you know, Cyndi Lauper. It was all good music. And I didn't I didn't have any judgment on it. I just knew if I liked it or not. And I, I somehow maintained innocence in that place where I just, the only criteria of whether I think something is good or not is if it's authentic. If it's authentic, it's good. If it's fake, it's bad doesn't matter what style it is. Exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, like around the 2008-2009 era, uh, you dropped your second album, I think. Yeah. With, to this guy. Yeah, to this guy. And mm-hmm. you know what? It, it, I was today years old when, when you <laughs> know, like, because I was, I was listening to I Made It the other day. And I'm just like, I look up to the sky. And then I saw the the album name. I'm like, that is freaking genius right there. <laughs> oh, no, but, yeah, yeah, to the sky. Yeah, but I made it was a huge part of my life. Uh, That's so cool. Because, uh, you know, like, I never thought that I was going to be able to, like, graduate high school or nonetheless, like, you know, be on the phone talking to you or to any other musician. Or um, So, you know, I look back and I, I'm like, man, like, like, where was your mind when you were writing this? Because this is like, this is like a masterpiece for somebody that was given only so much, and then to be able to overcome that and, you know, create a business or you know just, oh, create his own journey into, into the music world without knowing anything, you know. So where where was your mindset when writing this song and? How did the 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 collaborations happen? Well, you know, first off, thank you for that because that's that's the best compliment I could get. And you know, if I died today, then if I could, I mean, it sounds corny, but if if one person just got just got in a better mood and, and helped them achieve something or or you know find some strength inside from that, that's that's the best compliment I could get. You know, the way the way that song started, I was really like, I was like, you know, kind of like out of myself at the time in a way when I made that. I was kind of like, you know, I was on tour. I was doing sessions. I was back and forth. I was on planes every day. So I, I it's like when I think back to that time period, it's a lot of a blur. It was really, it was really them just coming to me and saying, baby wants, like, baby wants to do a song. Right, and he wants to get everybody on, on it, and he wants to call. He wants it. He wants to have a new group called Cash Money Heroes. Like he literally wanted to start another artist on the label, and it would just be everyone from Cash Money at all times, like one big gang. 
You know, and that's what I love about Baby because he 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 has these grand visions and he's like, fuck it, we're doing it. You know what I mean? He doesn't let anybody stop him or tell him it's a bad idea or, or anything. He's just like, yo, we're doing this because I say so. So I was like enlisted to basically make the record because I was the producer on the label and an artist, but still producer. So I, I, you know, they said make a beat, make a hook. So I, I wrote the beat and I and I and I did the hook. And when I did the hook, I did feel something special. I can't lie; like it did feel magical. Like it felt, it felt like, oh, okay, this, this is, this is going, this feels good. And then I sent it out. I left a lot of open verses. Sent it to Wayne. Sent it to Jay Sean. Sent it to everyone. I think everyone got it. And um, we got back those verses pretty much within three weeks to a month. And I put the verses in and switched it around and I was on the hook. And um, and then what happened was they, he called, baby, he called back and he said, where's your verse? And I said, no, I'm doing the hook and I produce it. Like, I'm good, man. Like, we're, we're fine. Like, I don't, I didn't feel like I needed to like be on it extra. No, you got to do a verse. So I do a verse, and then I send it back, and then literally like a month later, people from Universal that I, I would talk to, like you know, because you do radio stuff and you talk your relationships with those people, and be like, "Yo, your new single, man, it's crazy. I love it." I'm like, "Which one? What do you mean? I don't have a new single yet." And they said, oh, "The I made it song." I was like, "Oh no, 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 that's that's the Cash Money. Like that's where Baby wants to do a new new group." And they're like, oh, no, that's coming out in, in January. That's your song. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Uh, all right, let's go. I mean, you know, you're, you're on a roller coaster, you know. I'm not sitting around, like, thinking, like, well, I don't know if that would be the right artistic thing for me. And, and it was, and it turned out amazing. You know, it, was, it, it did really well. You know, the, the beauty, just like you said, looking back and you're kind of reevaluating things, I'm, I also sometimes reevaluate that time period with cash money knowing what i know about the rest of the business having lived through that as a producer and also just seeing the way things are now and it was a really magical time to be on that label and and a part of that because it had its own engine on it you know and you were you had your own engine on you but you you there was an engine on cash money that was moving forward and to be a part of it was like a major blessing at that time. So that was just, again, one of those things that Baby said, let's go, and we went, and the rest is history. That, that's beautiful, man. And uh, um, I think I saw two parts on, like, your TikTok of videos um, that that you made, like, eight songs with Lil Wayne. Yeah. Um, is there maybe, like, a... Like, do you, do you think you and Wayne will ever work together again? Because I feel like you guys were, you know, like, powerful together. <laughs> I do, too. I, I feel like there's a chemistry there. We did a song uh, last, or no, a couple of years ago called I Will Not Break. And um, that song was, um, you know, not, that was independent. So you di didn't have, like, the machine behind it. And, but it, it does, you know, as far as, like, if you want to talk about the new world, it streams pretty well. And, um, you know, I don't know how many people know about it. I think it's a great record. I know I love it. I know Wayne loved it. So I think I think we will do something in the future. I think there's something... I think there's something there, like, karmically, like, you know, when you connect with someone and... uh there's there's some kind of chemistry there that like I I definitely feel you know I I know Wayne he's just he's just working all the time so like even some records we did together I'd be like bro man thanks for that verse man that shit's crazy and he's like which one <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> he's like I mean you gotta understand he's he's making some two one two three four my, who knows how many records a night a day and. And that's the genius of him. He just keeps working. He just keeps going. He's like the he's the energizer bunny. He just doesn't stop. So, <laughs> so he he you know 
again, the great part of, of when some success or a lot of success does come, you just, you're just working so much, you don't realize even what's out in the world, you know, when you put out, like I look at a lot of these kids on TikTok and, and they're like, oh, here's my song. And they're like watching the numbers and watching the views and watching the streams. And what you didn't have, really have that ability back then to watch all of it in real time. You just kind of had to have faith, you know, and then get back to work. Right. Because if you made a record, what would be the, new, the thing? You didn't go and promote it like you'd promote it in terms of radio and, you know, video and, and like the basic media things that one would do back then. But you weren't like posting about it and looking to see if it's reacting. That's a brand new thing. So I feel for those kids who who they're just they're, they post their stuff and they're like looking for a reaction almost to see if they should even continue. And I don't know if it's healthy to have a feedback loop or a feedback system that early on when you're when you're discovering who you are. I mean, I think there's good parts to it because you can see if people like this sound or that sound, but at the same time, you you you, you miss a lot of the, the, the just having faith in yourself and in the process part. I think you or you have to maybe work a little bit harder to have that. You know, I, it was just when I was on Cash Money, it was like we're putting this shit out and this shit's about to go, and that's it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, <laughs> now now go back in the studio, and make some new shit because we're gonna keep doing this. That was it. You weren't like being watched by a label if you were on a universal or sony you weren't you know putting out a song and then making a tiktok and they're watching the tiktok to see if they should even bother making a video or even or once they've made the video if they should even bother promoting it at radio like there was no system like that everyone just believed went in spent the marketing money did pulled all the levers and if it went it went and if it didn't that was it but then the flip side of it is you were done. If it didn't work, you do that one or two times and it's not working, you're off the label, you're done. You don't have this like little kind of um, connection with your fans and, and, and just like a real healthy, you know, streams coming in and, and this back and forth with your fans. So it's just, it's just a different, it's just a whole different format altogether, but definitely it kind of requires a different mindset. Yeah, and uh, uh, like I was listening to your, I was listening to your music, to your, uh, to your latest music, and one song that really, that really caught my ear was uh, "Generation Maybe." Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, like I love, I love, I love that song, and you know it really spoke to me. And uh, but can can you talk to me about your mindset in that song when writing it? Yeah, that song was. Um ties back to what we were just saying, which is really kind of no one's sort of sure of themselves anymore. Everyone is looking to see what someone else thinks of them for validation. And when I say generation maybe, I'm just kind of saying it's a little bit of a throwback song in the sense that, I don't know, something that was funny. When I was, when I was writing that song, I, I kept thinking about a certain Billy Joel song where he kind of talks about like, um, oh, what was the name of the song? It's a huge song. It's slipping my mind at the moment. Uh, is it We Didn't Start the Fire? No, no, there's one more. It's it, it, it's something, it's just something about how, yeah, it basically the message is like, y'all don't know what's going on right now. Like, you, you, back in the day, you don't understand what we had, like the old, you know, the, the old music. And that's kind of what I was saying a little bit in a way. I don't, you know, I don't want to like, position myself as like I don't know what's going on now because I do I watch I'm I'm in the game I'm I'm seeing it all happen but I think I was just sort of like saying man you guys don't know what's going on right now like it didn't used to be like this and you shouldn't rely on anyone else's approval because at the end of the day you're just not going to get very far doing that you know everyone's trying and testing and waiting to see and that doesn't birth artists that just births people who are shifting lanes every few seconds. And I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it sometimes, especially when things are changing so fast. But I just wanted to get across that you have to believe in yourself and your vision of things because the world is going to change. But if you change with it, 
you're always going to be last. And if you stand in one place long enough, you'll be right. That was beautiful, man. Holy smokes, I'm over here crying. No. <laughs> uh, and, and you know what? That's how I always felt because, like, uh, um, I, I feel like nobody has ever understand, uh, has never understood, like, my my vision. Which is Doesn't kind of matter. Funny, which is kind of funny because I'm blind from one eye, so... Um, you know, it's like, oh, do they have to have like blurry vision or, but, uh, I just feel like nobody's really understand my vision because, um, you know, coming, coming from where I came from and, you know, like, I, you don't know this, but I'm disabled and I'm blind from one eye and all that stuff. So, so when, so when I got into the game, I was just like, we'll see what happens then. Then everybody's then everything started happening and I'm just like, How did I do this? And I I was thinking back the other day, I'm like, How did I do this? Like, this is so weird. Like, you know, I never really expected to ever be on the phone with anybody. Uh, you know, like from shows you how powerful you are. Yeah, like, you know, I just manifested that and that's one thing that I've always, you know, tried to work on, like, you know, uh even though like I'm a very negative person, but I try to, I try to see the positive and everything, or the negative and everything. But I don't know. Like negative is always trying to win me over. But you know, like I always listen to bu- music, so you know whether it be a negative message or a positive message, I just try to, you know, build my mindset through all of that, and hopefully, you know, it takes me to where I need to be. Well, it's all in your mindset, you know. I mean, you can make your any kind of disability an advantage or a disadvantage. You know, you've got to make it an advantage. I was reading a, a book. It's called Answer Cancer, and I fortunately don't have cancer and don't know many people who who do or have. But there's this book really has nothing to do with with it. But it has some, and I don't know why because it's really all it's all about mindset, really. And it said. The definition to the to the writer, to him, to this person who's writing the book, he said, my definition of love is to look for the good. And that's a really interesting thing. So to love somebody is to look for the good in them. To love something is to look for the good in it. To love your life is to look for the good in it. And that's what we struggle with so much now when we talk about negativity we're constantly being bombarded with numbers and facts and things and statistics and likes and whatever in, in every field, not just music or art. There's so much information and it becomes more challenging to look for the good. And I love that definition because it's it's the only definition that I've heard of, of love that actually made sense to me. When you love somebody, you're just always thinking about the good in them. When you love something, you're thinking about the good. And we can easily get shifted to the negative. You know, I could say, whatever, I live in this town and everyone's so friendly and so fun. Everything's so great. I feel so good here. Or we can say, you know, they're giving out parking tickets. There's a pothole here. Whatever. I'm just using random examples. But that's a choice and there are people who live in that same town who are looking at one or the other and they're having they're experiencing the whole place in their own life that way and it just becomes all about looking for the good and i think when you do that you become really really powerful because now you've taken the power back into your own hands and to look for the good right exactly you can always you can always find something imperfect or you wish were different but sometimes addressing that is not the best thing because if you if you focus on the good then the good sort of balloons out and and sort of the rest is sort of either disappears or changes or it just shifts some something in you where you get the power back and that's something that I was reading this week that I really liked I'm I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to check that out. Um, check that book out. You said what's the book called again? It's called Answer Cancer, and it's At- it's 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 basically saying that um you know it, it, I don't want to I don't want to 
explain the whole book because I, I've, I've really kind of just dipped in and out of it. And it's, it's, it's strange. It's about a doctor who was treating cancer patients. So, um, anyway, it, it doesn't matter. It just, there's just some great bits in it that I, I, I found really, really great, really empowering. I'll, I'll have to check that out soon. And, um, uh, maybe I'll message you on TikTok and tell you that I loved it or. Do know. it. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just, is this your, I, I, I'll just, I'll just, I'll send it to you or just look it up. Answer cancer. You can find it on Amazon. Yeah. 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 Well, this, this is, this is my personal number. So yeah, if that's the question you were asking. Oh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, your music often blends elements of rock and pop and hip hop. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you approach in incorporating these different genres into your sound? And, you know, cause like to me, I feel like for you, it's so easy, but I'm just like, how the heck, like, how, like, this it's is really, so it's, it's, it, it honestly, uh, t sometimes to my detriment, it's too easy. I can literally take any song and make it go in any direction. And you will think it's a completely different song. I've always been able to do that. I don't know why. I think it's just that I had such a crazy, insanely broad background of music growing up. And I can make it go any way. So for me, sometimes the struggle is to make the decision to just go in a certain direction. But really, a lot of what I learned from that was that time that I talked about earlier working with Timbaland. And you can tell the listener, like I'm just giving really specific production tips now, but you can tell the listener <clears throat> what kind of song it is with certain things. <clears throat> and the main thing is drums, your kick and your snare. So you can tell the listener, if I put a gated reverb snare on, everyone's just going to go, oh, my God, it sounds like the 80s. If I put, like, a hard 808, it's going to sound like hip-hop. So that's one way to do it, right? If I put a certain kind of reverb on the vocal, or if I double the vocal, or if I don't, or if I push it up front, those are going to be different things too. It's, if I put a lot, if I soak it in reverb, it's going to sound like an indie record, right? Yeah. If I put, if I put, a, you know, and again, this list goes on and on and on. But this is this is like the palette that I think every producer should know. A lot of them just, you know, these days get FL Studio and like they're making beats and they play like dark piano chords and put an 808 on it and they're done. And that's fine to me. That's not enough. Like that's not you're not doing enough if you if that's all you do. But um. <clears throat> Aside from all that, it's just it's just choices, sonic choices, you know, melodic choices, sonic choices, but mainly sonic, you know. It's kind of like it's kind of like a big collage. I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if if anybody that's listening, honestly, like you said, like these are some tips. So take them with you. <laughs> take them home. Get to work. Um, as an artist, how do you navigate to ever evolving music industry and stay true to your creative vision? That's tricky, you know. It, it's changed so much, and it just keep, feels like it feels like it changes every six months, like genuinely, fully changes. And obviously, s social media has changed everything. Streaming has changed a lot of everything. I think it's really cool that people are discovering older music now through streaming and they're not caring because it's sort of so faceless that they're discovering songs on playlists they don't know are 45 years old and are becoming top 10 songs again. I think that's so cool. I think music's become more timeless. I think people are more open in, in, in a certain way. They're less, um, they're less sort of judgmental on the surface, I think. You know, sometimes I don't think that, but I think at least from a pure music perspective, I think they don't care how old or, or, or new a song is. I think that's cool. Um, as far as the industry itself goes, I think that, uh, I think like, like a lot of people that I know in it are like kind of wrestling with it in a way is that sort of nobody knows every, anything, you know, like back in, Back in the day, like, you made a record that sounded like a hit record. It felt like a hit record, and it was a hit record because of that. And now, we like, I think that just the consensus, at least, like, on the industry side is we don't know anything. <laughs> like, anything can go. We do our best to – people think, like, the music 
industry is like evil or something. I, I see that on TikTok a lot. And it's really not. If, if anything, it's just it's just a lot of ignorance and 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 maybe people are spending money on the wrong things at times. But I, there's no there's no evil in it. It's just everyone's trying to figure it out, you know, and they don't know and no one knows. So that's good and bad. It's bad because sometimes I sit down and I go, oh my God, like. Like, not that I'm trying to make a hit record every day. I'm trying to express myself. But sometimes I just, like, I'll be like, oh, man, I want to make something that knocks in the club. Or sometimes I'll be like, I want to write this little ballad or, or something like that. And it's almost like it's just like this giant sea of, of of like, we don't even know what anything is anymore. You know, that, that ballad could be remixed into the club banger. And the club banger may be... You know, you lo-fi it out, and maybe it's an indie record. We don't know. You know, it could be it could be anything. So, when I create, sometimes my biggest challenge is, what am I making? You know, like of course I I love doing this, and I'll always write and always create. But like, what what's the what am I trying to get across? Is it? Yeah, of course you always write from your heart. You always write what you feel is 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 the best song or the most expressive song you want to. You want to put your, but but it's in terms of like some kind of format, like I just see it like a lot of new artists, like they'll put out like 17 singles and they'll all be different styles and then one will catch and they'll just kind of like rinse and repeat that one. And I don't I don't think that's a bad idea at all. I think that can be a good idea. You know, you see what your audience is feeling and then you, you give them more of that. That's logical. But to me, it's like a lot of haze, you know, around things, whereas People back in the day would be like, "All right, man, we're gonna make some shit. We're gonna make this. We're gonna make that." And and then those people are almost like, "Uh, what am I making?" <laughs> oh man, uh, yeah, and yeah, because I've I've seen I've seen all of that stuff, and it, it gets pretty wild sometimes. I'm just like trying to give them like, "Oh, I heard this. You should do it like this." Yeah, but I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, no, it's 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 all over. And, and, and but again, so we that's kind of like the part that's a little bit confusing possibly. And then there's the great part, which is you're never out and you're never in. You just you just kind of you're you're a creator and you you keep making what you want to make. You know, people were I think had their hands tied for a long time from an industry point of view. There's a lot of artists and probably still are that are signed to a label and made one kind of record and are kind of suddenly under pressure to keep making that same record and we don't know that that's the best move anymore you know like we no one knows if that's even the right thing to do like people are going left and right and trying things but again like they don't have to they don't have to go crazy they can you can post a second of it see if it reacts on TikTok. all those things you know it's it's just it's it's like a a lot of giant ways i don't know how to describe it man it's just like a it's not it's not as clear as it was i guess is is kind of what i'm trying to say but because it's as because it's unclear there's a lot of room for new there's a lot of room for movement there's a lot of room for different styles and things that that can that can work and you can you can i think be more true to yourself in terms of presenting yourself your vision your music your art all of it it's less packaged people are craving authenticity especially in this world with AI and computers and everything's generated for you. I think, I think it's like kind of cool to leave shit like real out of tune and like off time and real vibey and just very human sounding. So I love that. I love that new part of it. Yeah, and the, uh, um, like that's one thing. Like what you said about change and making different sounds and stuff. Like I finally get it now because, and I've understood it for a while now like maybe for like a year or two, but like, you know, my favorite band, uh, they came out like, you know, they came out swinging when they came out with their first album. And then it just kind of turned into like a family, family vibe, rock or pop. And I'm just like, dude, what the heck is this? Like, and you know, I feel bad because I'm just like, I don't like these guys anymore. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm going to support them. But you know, I totally get it now because... Dude, and, and it's tough, man, especially when you have a lot of success with your first thing. You'd think you would just be able to repeat it, but then, you know, don't forget, if you're a real artist, that's suddenly boring to you. Like, the second Let It Rock came out, I was bored with it. I was like, let's make another one. I was like, I already did that, you know? 
Yeah. So so if you're like kind of an artist artist, that's that's the way you feel. You don't want to repeat yourself. You want to do something new. You want to show a different side. But I understand it. It's like go to McDonald's. You're not going to get blueberry. Well, make a blueberry pancake. You want a fucking Big Mac and fries because it's McDonald's and. You want to know McDonald's is there in your mind. You want to know you can go there. You want to know you can get that Big Mac, and they're not switching up on you. You know, you're not getting going in there and getting sushi. You know what I mean? Like, a sushi restaurant needs to be a sushi. You know, a Japanese restaurant needs to be a Japanese restaurant. You know, if you go to a Japanese restaurant and they serve you blueberry pancakes, you're like, what? Now you don't trust the blueberry pancakes, and you don't trust the Japanese food. Even though maybe they were the best restaurant in the world, it's it's off-putting somehow, you know? <laughs> Dude, I go to a Chinese restaurant to eat their crawfish. <laughs> yeah, but but they're cooking them in a Chinese recipe. I'm sure with like you know they got the chili peppers and the the, the soy sauce and the whatever sesame yeah. oil. I don't know whatever they do. You know they're not making it like Cajun style, right? Maybe they are. <laughs> they're not. No. And uh, you have a. I think I think it's Welcome to the World. There's there was supposed to be three versions of that, right? Or there was. No, there was supposed no. Originally, Kanye was going to get on it, and you know, it was like it, it, it was just kept waiting. You know, I mean, people say like Kanye is like yeah, because like when you got a big record, like you pick up the phone. You know what I mean? Like for real, like an artist who, however big or as they may be at the time, when you got when you're in the top five, you can make phone calls for real. And I wasn't doing it, but but the label was doing it, and we were waiting on that Kanye verse, and just didn't get it. So, um, but it wasn't, you know, Rick Ross, like he, you know, we had a relationship with him and, and he, he, he like murdered it. You know, he did so great. It wasn't a backup. It was literally just at the time when it was like, okay, you know, like we, we got it. We, we, we need to make something happen here. And, and then, um, and by the way, he's like, that dude is like, he's probably the coolest person in the whole industry. Like he's just, he's the best. He's just the nicest most pure person he's so cool and then um and then kid cuddy was was getting signed to republic you know day and night was was happening on the internet and and there was like this big big deal around him at the beginning again this is early days this is you gotta you gotta rewind a little bit right he hadn't put anything out yet except day and night and um and so they they felt that we should get him uh, on it for like a radio version and he did great too. He's he's amazing. He's an incredible artist. So I was just I was in the middle of just being, you know, very very blessed and very fortunate to to have had those. So but we never got the Kanye one because we put out those records. I don't know whatever happened with that. I wasn't really like involved in the inner workings of that, you know, and I, I'm a huge Kanye fan. I'm a fan of all of them, you know. I'm I I'm I feel very blessed to to have worked with had people on on songs that I've done, you know, at all like fucking it was one it was a real dream for 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 me to 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 be in that arena and uh very cool man oh yeah man and i've 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 heard it all and i'm just like man like this is so cool like uh when i like i would get from one song and be like oh cool it's rick ross and then go to another one and like so cool it's wayne and then <laughs> go to the very end i'm like limp biscuit fuck yeah <laughs> Yeah, he, they, Limp, Fred, and then were they were they had a situation of cash money for a little while, so he was over there, and um, and uh, we did that Champions record. It's kind of like a reprise to a to a I Made It type song, you know, with like a lot of people on the label. Um, so yeah, that that was sick. That was a fun video too. Everyone was at that video. There, Busta was at that video. Mystical came through. Oh my, like a lot. They had signed a lot of a lot of the you know different. They were they were all like you know, circulating around cash money at the time. And uh that was fun, man. A lot of a lot of cool features. Obviously Wayne and Fred and, and everyone on the song was there. It was, it was good good times, man. Good fun to look back at. Um not fully appreciating how how amazing it was to get all those people in the same room at the same time, you know? Yeah. I'm still trying to go to my first Limp Biscuit concert. <laughs> One day. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're great. And uh um, earlier you mentioned, well, in, like, while you were talking, you mentioned wrestling, but of course you were talking about, like, you know, wrestling things and, um, but, uh, you've been, you've been, like, sort of involved throughout the years with, uh, with, uh, with the music of, 
of WWE? Like, how th- how did that come about? They just reached out. You know, they started using some of the songs in their in their promos and their their shows. And um, from there, I I I did become really friendly with um, some of the people over there in the music side of things, and they're just the coolest. So that led to playing SummerSlam and and uh, some other shows and things like that with them and. They've just always been really supportive. You know, they don't they don't follow any industry standards of anything. They don't like you can't move them, you can't convince them. They just pick what they like, what's right for their platform, and they just move with it. So it's just been like a good marriage of 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 music and and wrestling. You know, not something I ever anticipated. It just worked out. That's awesome, man. And you know, like, wrestling has always been a huge part of my career, and, you know, that's how I discovered you, and I'm like, I made it? Hell yeah, let's do this. Or even, like, P.O.D. or Creed. Yeah. Like, I, I just love it, because back then, I don't know about now, because, I don't know, I don't understand the music that they're using now with. Are you a fan know. of anything that's new? Honestly, no. It's interesting. Well, uh, are we talking artists or? Yeah, artists. Uh, no, honestly, like I've I've just been discovering older older musicians that I didn't give a chance to when I was growing up. Hmm. So that's interesting. That that's interesting for even me to hear. You know, no, I mean not even me, but like just from the outside. You know. Well, well, you, well, you know what? Uh, I have a. Like later on tonight, I'm interviewing uh, this hip hop rock band or hip hop. I don't know. They're they're like the Suicide Boys. Okay. Um, and my my cousin's like, check out the Suicide Boys, man. Like maybe you'll like them if you like this music. And you know, I'm, that that's what I'm gonna do. That's what I'm gonna do later on today when when we get off the phone and stuff. Like I'm gonna listen to the Suicide Boys, and you know, I'm gonna go back and listen to their music. They're called Popular Loner. Like, their music is just so 90s, and and I love it's it. I, I I guess it's just, I'm not, I guess I'm stuck in an era. I hate to say that, but I guess I'm stuck in an era. I, I think everyone is in this day and age, you know. I think they like what they like, and if, you, if you're new and you've got something that's, you know, resonating with them, and then then it works. Are there any particular songs or albums that hold a special significance to your person to you personally? If so, could you share a story behind them? Sure. Um I think they they're really they're really like a wide variety. Um one of them is is I think you to the Joshua Tree was a big one for me. Bob Marley, I would just pick greatest hits because I think almost, you know, it's a very, like, comprehensive um, group of songs. I love Sade, love Deluxe. Uh, I love the Carter Three, Lil Wayne. Uh, I mean, it's really, you know, I love Jay-Z, the Black Album. You know, there's just a lot of, a lot of, all kind. Of, again, these are, these are songs that are, like, and and albums that are, tied to different parts of my life, you know, where, where that's, that's where I was getting out. That's where I was taking refuge. You know, that's where I was getting, getting that emotional, um, um, sort of resonance from. But, um, if I were to pick one, that's tough. You know, I think, I think, um, I would pick you to the Joshua Tree just because that song opened me up to songwriting in a, in a different way and and just like what I like I I like like very abstract songwriting which is what a lot of that has on it. You two has always been more abstract. Today I think a lot of the well not even today but in the in, you know recent history you know, songs have to sort of have a concept and be about something. And I just love that the way, you know, that earlier you two would just sort of paint emotional pictures and landscapes that you could, 
sort of dive into and, and live inside. Um, that would be a lot of the reason that that, so that would be like an important record for me because it's where I go when I write. You know, I don't, I don't really completely connect with a lot of the way modern songs are written, which is, all right, all right, what's the concept? What, what it's, what, you know, when I lived in Nashville, it was very much about that. And, and some amazing songs are clearly written from that, that method. But, um, I kind of think of myself as more like an abstract painter and throwing, um, words or, or paint on a canvas, if you will, and kind of doing it subconsciously and then making sense of it after. Because that's kind of what the real you, what your insides want, want to say and what you want to get out. And then you, you sort of use the process and your rational mind of crafting it into an actual song that makes sense or doesn't. It doesn't have to make sense. There's no rules. It could be about something else. Many of the songs that we think are about a certain thing or about something completely else. So that's, that was a big, big album for me. A big album for me, for sure. Yeah, and I I honestly feel that U2 is probably the, one of the most underrated bands ever because they don't get the love that that they deserve, in my opinion. I mean, they, you know, listen, they can go around the world and sell out stadiums. You know, they're, everything's totally fine in their world, and they've been doing that for 30, 40, 50 years. Who knows? But uh, not 50, maybe 40. 50, 50, I don't even know. Um, they, you know, yeah, I mean, are they, like, in fashion at this moment? Probably not, you know, not the same way. I don't know if kids are rediscovering it the way they're rediscovering some other things, but that's just a time thing. That's just a seasonality thing, you know? It's like people like skinny jeans, people like baggy jeans. Now they're back to back skinny jeans because everyone likes baggy jeans, you know? Like I, I think I think uh, their their catalog and what they put into the world will be around forever. Yeah. Um, you know, and I forgot a lot of other albums. I mean, Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run. I mean, there's just so many... It's so, so, so many things that impacted me at different times. But if I think about the core, like the core group, it's probably like more what I mentioned. But there were times when I only listened to hip hop, and I wasn't. I was listening as a producer. I was listening as a student. You know, I'd listen to '80s hip hop, '90s hip hop. You know, uh, early 2000s hip hop. I, I think the, the the wave of of production that came from the Neptunes and Timbaland and Dr. Dre and early Kanye that was a big part of my development as far as being a producer goes, you know, listening to sounds and textures and samples and and, and just picking up on that energy. I, I was in love with the fact that those were just really creative records. They were really smart, cool, interesting, creative records, but they were also big records. And they also had, you know, they felt good. That's just, to me, like the main criteria of music, and it should be, which is you have to, it has to feel good to you, right? Like, yeah, to exactly. make you feel good. If it doesn't make you feel good, doesn't mean it can't be sad, but it has to. It has to. It has to, to to like jive with you. You know, it has to. You know, that's how we think we we find our artists. We pick our music. If if you're a real music lover and you're you're someone who really, who really hears and listens, not just someone who like, listens because it's on their workout or dinner time playlist or whatever. I mean, I don't. I have a hard time understanding like what that means like i i can't music to me is not an accessory to your life and that's kind of how it's been presented now it's like this is what i listen to when i go out this is what i listen to when i do this this is this is my studying music this is my chilling music this is my and i think what like i can't understand that like this is the music that changed your life at a time period this is the music who helped you discover who you want to be in this world this is the music that those are the things that that i connect with this is the song this was what made it okay to do this or this is what gave me the strength to do this that that's where i that's that's the page that i'm on that's like the wavelength of what i want to listen to and what i want to create uh hell yeah man and that's how it should be it's music music is a weird place but you know, sometimes it's just beautiful where it can take you. It really is. It's 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 a it's a wild it's intention, and you know we where there's so much love for some one thing and so much hate for another, and so much apathy for something else. You know we 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 hear people's intentions through it. We we hear 
you know, if it's if it's fake or not. We hear if it's produced enough or underproduced or overproduced or or what, you know, we can hear what time period it's from. You know, I have a an eight year old son and I play a game with him in the car sometimes. When I drive him to school, I'll play, I'll run through Spotify and I'll play a song and I'll say, what what era was this from? Like, is this 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, recent, you know, late early 2000s, whatever. And he's pretty good at it. He's really good at it, actually. He he can hear, like I'll say, I'll play him something like an old Beatles record. And I'll say, what makes, what, how, he'll say, 60s. And I'll say, what, what made you know it's from the 60s? He said, well, I listened for the hiss. You know, oh, the, hiss wow. and the, the hiss and the analog tape. So I started showing him little tricks and listening to the drums. And like, for example, if you listen to an 80s record, you're going to have a lot of more traditionally reverb on the drums and like more of like a gated or reverb sound. Whereas in the 70s, they were like tight. And so so he'll start listening for those little little elements to tell him when something is from. But I, I, I like playing that game. And, it's it, you know, I, I learn a lot through him as well. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, I like I like to end every every interview with this question. It's more of a fun one. Um, so uh, if you were stuck in an elevator with any musician, dead or alive, who would it be, and what would you talk about? Um, that's a great question. It would probably be. I think I think Bob Marley because I think you'd learn a lot and you'd have a great time. You just have fun. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, I think that would be the cool. That, I don't think there's anyone I'd rather be stuck. At. You know, you'd know you have fun. He'll probably be, he'll probably be end up really high by the end of it. Also, yeah. Probably light, right? Light something up, and you'll be, you'll be flying when you get out of that elevator. He'd probably relax you a lot too. He'd be like, bro, just, come on, man, cool, man. Don't worry about that. Everything, all right. We're gonna get down. You know, know <laughs> <All> that. <laughs> that that would actually be pretty freaking great, honestly. <laughs> right. And uh, like, are are we gonna be hearing anything new from you, 2023 at the yeah. end or 2024? Yeah, I'm gonna be, yep, I'm I'm gonna be dropping a lot of a lot of singles, um, possibly an EP, and um, I I was actually planning on something coming out next week, and then I I've been producing some outside artists and stuff for the last few weeks, so I. Uh, I had to push it back a little bit, but there'll, there'll definitely be some a lot more stuff coming from me for sure. Hell and yeah. also, you can follow me on uh, TikTok, Kevin Rudolph. Instagram is just Kevin Rudolph. Twitter, Kevin Rudolph. Facebook, Kevin Rudolph. YouTube, you know, all of it. Like and subscribe, baby. Hell yeah, uh, Kevin. I want to thank you so much for for taking some time and yeah, dude. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this this was a long shot, honestly. Like I was like, he's not gonna see this, but I'm so glad she did, man, because it's a dream. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. It's fun to it's fun to like get to talk about all the the old stuff, the new stuff, and and everything in between. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Kevin Rudolph. And remember that without music, life would be a mistake. <laughs>